we've been doing a study, beginning a study in the book of Revelation. And Jesus commissioned the Apostle John to write this final revelation of the end times. And he commissioned him in this way. Look at verse 19 of chapter 1. Therefore, the words of Jesus to John, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things. So he's divided this revelation, you might say, into three sections. He says, first of all, write the things you have seen. Now he did that in chapter 1. And in chapter 1, he saw the glorified, heavenly Jesus Christ, now grab this, ministering actively to his churches and in the midst of his churches. Every one of his churches. It's churches, not the church. It's those individual churches that he cares about and he's ministering actively in their midst in his glorified position. And, and we see that in chapter 1. That's what he saw. And then in chapters 2 and 3, we see the things which are. In those two chapters, Jesus has specific messages given to specific churches now there are three aspects of those messages that are given to the churches the first one is they are indeed a specific word given to those individual churches at that time historically jesus had a message for those churches that's the first aspect the second is those churches provide for us, you might say, a picture. They are representative of all churches in the entire church age. So these messages pertain to all of God's churches. Any church, at any time, in any period, in any place in world history, right up to the present, can find that little church mirrored in one or more of these churches right here. And so we spent some time before we got into Revelation looking at the message of Jesus Christ to his churches. But there is a third aspect of these churches. And that is a prophetic aspect. What is intriguing about these churches is that they provide, interestingly, a panorama of church history from the age of the apostles, a prophetic panorama, from the age of the apostles, from the time of this writing, right to the end of the age and the rapture of the church. Now, the early church could not see that. They were right at the beginning. But the church today that cares to notice, this church, as Paul put it, on whom the end of the age has come, it is crystal clear. Now that's interesting because if he had given these messages in any other order than the order in which he gave him, this wouldn't work. So the order in which he gives these messages becomes very significant. And what I would like to do this morning is we looked at these churches individually in some detail. What I would like to do this morning is just look at them in a very quick overview and look at them in this prophetic sense, how they prophesy church history right from that day until the end, and then draw a, a, an application to us today with that. So uh, we are, I believe, very, very likely uh, the last generation of the church age before the Lord comes for His church. So I want to look at I want to look at a panorama of church history and point out some things to you that I think you'll find very interesting. And it ought to uh, uh, assure you all the more that this is the living Word of God. It's not accidental. It's not just the words of men. So that panorama of church history. Remember the first church he had a message to was the church at Ephesus? And he said a lot of good things about Ephesus. He said, man, you're doing a lot of good work. So you, just, you guys are, you know, are, are really busy doing good things for the Lord. But the key to what he had to say to them is in verse 4 there. Do you realize that right there is sort of a synopsis of what was happening to the church right there at the end of the apostolic age? If you were to put dates on this church and what was going on here, 
you could take it from like 70 A.D. when the temple was destroyed and, and the apostolic age was pretty much coming to an end to about 160 A.D. And it was, it, it was a period that, uh, that it, generally speaking, was what, what he said to Ephesus was taking place in the church in general. It's interesting that even at the end of the apostolic age, the church was already leaving, drifting from that simple, that pure, that dynamic faith in and just love for Jesus Himself. Was leaving the concept of a personal relationship with Jesus that is the most important aspect of our, uh, of our walk with Him. It was becoming involved in doctrinal controversies and theological discussions one person put it this way it was pounding out the teaching of the church on the anvil of controversy it was becoming increasingly formal and perfunctory you know sort of mechanical in the way it operated and it was drift, drifting from that place of loving fellowship with jesus into an attitude where human endeavor became of chief importance you know, I don't care that you're spending an hour in the morning in prayer. What are you doing for the church? It was sort of the attitude that was coming out. The simplicity and the purity of the gospel of love for Jesus Christ almost immediately was being etched away. Almost immediately. Now there's a lesson here for Christians, brethren. Listen. This is the first thing that begins to wane in a person's walk with the Lord when he comes to Christ. It, it's almost a, 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 a natural waning. That childlike love, that love relationship and that simple trust and that fellowship with Jesus begins to wane. And their Christianity becomes more formal, more perfunctory, more activity-oriented. His admonition to this church is in verse 5. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds that you did at first or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand, that's that church in general, out of its place unless you repent. Do you see what he's saying? Relationship with you is more important to Jesus than all that you're doing in His name. His relationship with you is much more important. You know, we see it in that little incident with Mary and Martha in Luke 10, don't we? Jesus is there at Mary and Martha's house, and he's kind of in the living room, I would say, and, and he's just sharing with the disciples and some of the other people gathered there, and Mary is just sitting there at his feet and just soaking in everything he's saying. Now, Martha is busy in all the preparations and the serving and everything like this, and and the Bible even says, in the New American says, she was distracted by her preparations. I like it. Distracted by her preparations. And she's getting flustered, and she's getting upset. There's so much to do, so much serving to do. And finally, Mary is just sitting there listening to Jesus, and finally, in frustration, Martha says, Lord, I am left alone to do all the serving here, and there's Mary there. Tell Mary to come and help me. You ever feel that way? Jesus said, Mary, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about so many things, but only one thing is really necessary. And Mary has chosen the better part, and I am not going to take that away from her. Martha was doing good stuff. She was doing important stuff, but it was distracting her from the most important things. And so you've got this church at Ephesus. And you know what that church was like? They were being great Marthas. Oh, were they a busy, active, serving, working church. They were being great Marthas, but in all their busyness, they forgot to be a Mary. And so his word, his word to them is in verse 5, Therefore, remember where you have fallen. Remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first. Go back to that place. Whatever it takes, whatever it means in your daily life, in your walk, and even your, your quote-unquote service, go back to that place. Repent and go back to that place. Ephesus was, uh, was drifting away from that in all its activity. 
and that was the church at the close of the age of the apostles. However, there was something that made a significant contribution to keeping that church pure and on the mark in those early years. You know what it was? It was intense Roman persecution. And it's interesting that the next church he has a message to is the church at Smyrna. And look what he says to the church at Smyrna there in verse 8. And to the angel of the church at Smyrna write, the first and the last who was dead and has come to life says this, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested. And you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Smyrna was the persecuted church. And it's interesting, in that era, say from 160 to about 306 A.D., it's known as the Age of the Martyrs. It's the known as the Age of the Great Persecution of the church in those early years. Now, understand this, the church has always been persecuted. Christians have always been persecuted. In fact, I don't know if you knew this, but more believers have died for the gospel of Jesus Christ in the 20th century than any other time in world history. So that's always been the case. But when you go back to that first century, when you look at it in a, on a per capita basis, and you look at the concentration of it and the literal vileness of it, it stands out in church history. For instance, they weren't content with just imprisoning, pr imprisoning them or putting them to death, but they devised tortures, unimaginable tortures, to try to get them to recant and turn away from their Christianity and either worship the emperor or worship the gods of Rome. They didn't just crucify them. They didn't just throw them to the lions in arenas. They would put them on racks and stretch them apart until their bodies broke apart alive. They would pull their fingernails out. They would hang them by their thumbs. They would wrap them in animal skins and throw them into arenas so wild bulls would gore them to death. They did all kinds of unseemly things. They literally would cover them in tar and hang them on a pole and light them for the pagan parties in the gardens. If you're more interested in more of this, is this a wow, wow. Fox's Book of Martyrs will tell you more than you'll ever want to know about that era. But you know what's, what's interesting is, uh, particularly is what he says there, right there in verse 10, and you will have tribulation for 10 days, Jesus said. We can look at history and we can see in this era there were, guess how many? 10 edicts declared by Roman empire, emperors to persecute Christians. There were 10 of them in that area. It, era, it started with, um, with Domitian in about 96 AD. Actually, the first one came. And the last one was by a nine, an emperor named Diocletian. Around 300, just a little bit before 300, he began. And his persecution was absolutely the most intense. It was the 10th, and it was by far the worst. You know why it was the worst? Because they were seeing the persecution wasn't stamping out Christianity. And so he made it his goal to see that Christianity would get stamped out. And he tried harder than any of those other emperors to stamp out Christianity throughout the empire. But, you know, it was so clear that they were losing the battle. You know why? Because, now listen, this is important. When any Christian dies for Christ, it leads to other people coming to Christ. That's the way it works. That's why Paul said he would die for the glory of Christ. When that day to die came, it would be for the glory of Christ. One little example, there are hundreds of them, but one little example is one that was put into song actually a few years ago. It was about 40 Roman soldiers. It was right in the era of Diocletian. 40 Roman soldiers up in the province of Thrace, which is north of the Black Sea area up there. And uh, um, 
The, the edict had gone forth, you know, that they were, everybody was to worship the, uh, the, the idols of Rome. And these soldiers were part of what was known as the Thundering Legion. It was a, a highly decorated legion. And these 40 guys were probably some of the most highly decorated soldiers. They were, they were valiant. They were really the best of the Roman army. And they were all Christians. And the governor was so upset that these guys were Christians and wouldn't do it, he offered money and he offered all kinds of fame and reward and incentive if they would just go bow down you know they just go go through the motion do the act and none of these 40 guys would do it and it incensed the governor so much of course representative diocletian that he devised a way that they would die slowly he had them stripped it was in the winter time he had them stripped and taken out in the middle of a frozen lake put guards around the lake and they were to die out there. Now, just to encourage him, he had warm baths in different places around that lake that any time they felt like, I've had it, they could run, and they would put him in that warm bath and save him, save their life. You know what the 40 soldiers did? First of all, they, 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 they refused all of that. And they began to sing out there, 40 soldiers for Jesus, 40 brave soldiers for Christ. And they sang away into the night. Well, as it was getting later and darker and colder, finally one of those soldiers broke. And he ran to the edge of the lake to be saved. A guard who was there and saw that happen was so touched by these men, so convicted in his own heart, you know it, by the Holy Spirit, that when that guy ran and you could hear the song waning out there in the darkness in the middle of that lake, it wasn't 40 anymore. What are we going to sing? 39? He immediately tore off his armor. He tore off all his robes. And he ran out there screaming, 40 soldiers for Christ. 40 brave soldiers for Christ. And he joined the group and died with them. You know, I think it was Thomas a. Kempis that put it this way for this era. The seed of the gospel was watered by the blood of the saints. The church actually grew during that time. It became so obvious that in 306 A.D., when, when Diocletian died a morbid death, Constantine came to power in Rome. And Constantine, nobody knows whether he was truly a Christian. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of question about that. But he definitely... Uh, was, was warm toward Christianity, definitely warm toward, toward it. And in 306 A.D., he stopped all persecution. He, for the first time in its history, literally legalized Christianity and encouraged people to be Christian. Now, Christianity, in its relationship with the world, suddenly experienced a radical change that it had never experienced before in its 300-year history. Suddenly, it was okay. It was even acceptable. It was, it was almost cool to be a Christian. So that brings us to the church at Pergamum. Look at, look at what he says to Pergamum. Just look at verse 14. But I have a few things against you, Jesus said, because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. Now, if you don't know the story out of Numbers, just briefly, Balaam was hired by King Balak to curse the, it, the, the, the Israelites as they were making their way to the Jordan River to go into the Promised Land. He was a Moabite king. And Balaam couldn't do it. God would not allow it. So he hatched a plan. And basically it was this. Hey, listen, take some of those cute little Moabite girls. You've got a bunch of them. You take some of those cute little Moabite chicks and send them in the camp. And you take some of those handsome young Moabite men. You know, you know, those pagan guys can be so cute. And you send them into the camp to make friends. To make friends. And to show them some of the cool things you do, you know, how fun and, and, and exciting and cool idol worship can be. It's sort of the pagan way of partying out, you know? 
And they went in there to cause compromise in the camp. And Pergamum is indeed a, a, a church of, of compromise. Um, it's interesting. When Constantine, and this is history, when Constantine legalized Christianity, he did not make the world more Christian. But I'll tell you what he did do, what he contributed to. He contributed to making the church of Jesus Christ a lot more worldly. Because suddenly, for people in the world, it was, it was kind of a cool thing to be a card-carrying Christian. It, might, it was in many cases, it might be to their advantage to be a Christian, to be in a church, you know, politically, you know, business-wise, economically, to their advantage to do this. And the church came charging in to the church just to be a part of it. That whole idea of being born again and having a life-changing experience wasn't important. It was just being in the church. And so you know what happened there in Pergamum? The Moabites invaded the church, man. They came rushing into the camp. You know what I mean? And the church went through this incredible compromise. It's interesting that Jesus warned about this happening to the church. In Matthew 13, he gave seven parables that are sort of descriptive of the church age. The third one is known as the parable of the mustard seed. You'll remember that parable. You know, the, the, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that was planted, and it grew, and it became great like a tree. Mustard seeds don't produce trees. But this became like a tree. And even the birds of the air came and roosted in the branches of this great tree. You look at birds of the air in the Bible, and often they're used in kind of a negative sense. For instance, in Revelation, we're going to see it when we get there, in, in Babylon of the last days, when Babylon is described, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a den of demons, and it's a prison for every unclean and hateful bird. Well, those birds were nesting in this, which would be recognized as representative of the church of Jesus Christ, the visible church. And so the church, 306 A.D., really to the rise of the papacy, papacy in about 600, uh, Pergamon gives us a prime example of what was happening in the church. Also, during that period, notice what the next verse says there, verse 15. Chapter 2. So you also have some who are in the same way hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now, we don't know exactly who the Nicolaitans were, but we know the Ephesians would have nothing to do with them. And now they're kind of being embraced in Pergamum. We know this. The word means conquerors of the people. And it's very possible that they were promoting kind of a theology, kind of a church doctrine or something like that that was really calling for the church to have a hierarchy of priests, you might say, in charge of the people, and really spiritual overlords of the people. It's interesting that it was in this era, 300 to 600 B.C., that the priesthood really began to develop, to develop in the church. And this was an order of priests in the church, leading the church, as opposed to all of us being equal in and under Jesus Christ Himself. And that's important. Now, let me say this. There is a priesthood in the New Testament. Did you know that? There is a priesthood. But here it is. I'll just read it to you. It's 1 Peter 2.9. But you, are you, you Christian, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Guess what? There is a priesthood in the New Testament, and you're it. And I'll tell you something else while we're at it. There are saints in the New Testament. But it's not an order of saints that you have to attain to and be canonized somehow into that order it's none of this like well maybe mother Teresa is a saint but i'm not attitude listen to what paul says in romans 1 7 in his introduction and in his just introduction to, to the roman christians there he says there to all who are beloved of god in rome called as saints 
So brothers and sisters who have been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ through faith in Him, you them, you them, you're the saints. You can't get any more sanctified and cleansed and made new than by the blood of Jesus Christ shed for you. And being in that sense, washed in that blood. So, so brethren, these, th- these were the kinds of things that were going on in that era. And that brings us to Thyatira. Thyatira had a problem. It had a big problem in that church. Chapter 2, verse 20. I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Jezebel. There's a Jezebel in there. Jezebel in 1 Kings chapter 16 is the wife of King Ahab and she's an, an, an idolatrous woman to the core. And what she instituted in Israel was hor- horrific. She, there, was, there was always the problem of idolatry in Israel, but she made idolatry the state religion of the nation of Israel. Do you realize that? She instituted idolatry as the state religion of the nation of Israel, God's nation, persecuting anybody who would not adhere to her idolatry. It was no more now a matter of compromise. It was like, this is the way it is here. This is the way we do things. Interesting. 600 A.D. There is the church coming under the authority of a Jezebel. His name was Gregory, Pope Gregory II. Gregory II is the one who instituted for the Catholic Church papal infallibility. The Pope's word is the word of God. It was during this era too and under his leadership that idol worship became vogue in the church through the use of icons. Pictures, relics, statuary, the worship of these things, literal worship of them. It was his under his watch that Mary was deified. And now she was the mother of God and you pray to Mary. It was during this period that uh, sainthood was established and certain saints were venerated. It was there during this period that the lighting of candles and the use of incense became very much a part of the church. And you know what? Let me say this. Candles are pretty. My wife likes candles. Christmas time, we got candles all over the place. Lit all over. And, and I think they're pretty. I say, oh, look at candlelight. This is so pretty. That's not what we're talking about here. You may go into some of these churches and see candles all over the place. Oh, isn't it pretty? Doesn't it give you sort of a neat kind of aura? It's not what we're talking about. <laughs> Candle lighting has a, this mystical thing where, 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 where it actually is, is important mystically and spiritually to, to light that candle. It'll affect somebody eternally by lighting that candle. And the use of incense and everything like that was the same kind of a thing. You know, between the 6th and the 16th century, you know what that's called in history? The Dark Ages. It is, called, it, it is, it is by some called the Devil's Millennium. That's basically all there was, and that was basically the church. It's interesting that in the story of Jezebel, you have the story of Naboth's vineyard. Remember that one? Ahab wanted Naboth's Naboth's vineyard. And Naboth was just a godly sweet man. And that vineyard was his inheritance that when his family came to Israel, came to Canaan, and God, God dispersed the land, his family was given that. It was his inheritance from God, really. And he said, no, I cannot sell it. I cannot. It's, it's against God's law to sell it. I, I cannot and I will not sell it. And Ahab was so upset because he wanted Naboth's vineyard. And Jezebel comes along and says, well, I can take care of that. How did she do it? She had Naboth falsely accused of blasphemy. 
and had him killed and then the crown confiscated his land. That's how she did it. It was there in this area that you had going on in the church the Inquisition. Innocent people killed for trumped up charges of blasphemy. And so what happened to all their possessions and all their land? Confiscated by the church. Do you realize it was this era that the church became as incredibly wealthy and powerful as it did? And, and, and mostly through the Inquisition. Now, I don't want to be offensive. And I don't want to be throwing stones or anything like that. But at the same time, I've got to be dead honest with you. I look at Thyatira. And now follow me now. Follow me through. And that is the Catholic Church as a system as an institution. In fact, they live up to their very name, Thyatira. The word Thyatira in the Greek means perpetual sacrifice or continual sacrifice. You know what the Mass is? Many of you know because you've got Catholic background. It's literally partaking of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ in those elements. That those elements, they call it transubstantiation. Those elements literally become in the mass the body and the blood of Jesus Christ and you take that. And so Christ is continually being sacrificed. It's an ongoing and a continual and a perpetual sacrifice of Christ for our sins. That's why the Catholics have a crucifix, really. Jesus is still being sacrificed on that cross in a sense. He's still dying and his body broken and received and his blood shed for, for us. It's an ongoing thing. Now, brethren, that really muddies one of the key elements of biblical doctrine. And that is that when he died, he died once and for all for us. Listen to Romans 6.10. For the death that he died, listen, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Hebrews 10.10 By this we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. He says in 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also died for sins once for all. The just for the unjust. You know what Jesus on the cross, one of the last things he said was, what? It is finished. It is finished. Mission completed. Job done. Sins of the, of the world paid for right here at Calvary. And at that point, he could, he could release his spirit. Because the job was done once and for all and forever. That's why you'll see most of us with an empty cross. Because the job's done. He is risen and living. And in a glorified, say, in, 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 in a glorified way, Revelation chapter 1, ministering to his churches in love. The job is done. We have been redeemed. We are by his shed blood the saints of the living God, such as we are. And that's why Paul says, I beseech you that you present your body a living sacrifice to him, holy and acceptable, because he made it that way, which is your spiritual service of worship now. Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove out of your life, in your life, through your life, what the will of God is. You know what he says it is? He doesn't tell you exactly what it is, but he says this, it's good and it's acceptable. Good and acceptable. Acceptable to you. Yeah, cool. Good. I like this. And perfect. Just right for you. He says that. And so he says 
to Thyatira here, verse 22. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. You know, this religious system, he's saying something here. This religious system that really got started back in about 600 A.D. and is perpetuated to this very day, this system will go into the Great Tribulation. It'll be a part of that whole scene in the Great Tribulation. And when we get there, I think we'll see it. Now, having said that, I, I want to add this. There are Catholics, Catholics, Catholics who are sincere believers in Jesus Christ. Born again, sincere believers in Jesus Christ. They're part of His true church. And it's interesting with that in mind, what Jesus says in verse 24 and 25. Look at this. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. You just stray true to me all the way through. Until I come, point, I come for you. I'm coming for you. Now, subtle, subtle change takes place right here. And I want to point it out to you. Um, in his messages, there's two subtle changes that take place at this point. One is, you know, to every church, he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He says that to all seven of them. But in the first three before this, he said that, and then he gave the promise to those who would overcome. In the last four, including Thyatira, he gives the promise, he says everything he has to say, and he ends with, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Now, is that significant? Maybe that's telling us that a subtle change has taken place. Here's another one. All the promises to the overcomers now in, the next, in these last four churches, all the promises have to deal with the coming of Jesus Christ and that tribulation period. The promises and the warnings have to deal with the tribulation and the coming of Jesus Christ. I submit to you that the point is that these last four churches, although they begin at certain points in church history, will carry on right to the end of the age. And so we have Thyatira with us today. Now, unless we as Protestants begin feeling a little smug, sure glad I'm a Protestant, let's take a look at Sardis, shall we? The next church is Sardis. And what we have in Sardis is an incredible picture of the Reformation. Mark began with Martin Luther in the 16th century A.D. And it was an uprising against all the evils of, of, of the Catholic Church, of that Thyatiran Church. And, and people were now being called to faith in Jesus Christ as opposed to a lot of good works and doing all the sacraments and getting your indulgences and things like that. Just faith in Jesus Christ, that's a good thing. And, and, and they were called to the Word of God. To, to base your life on the Word of God rather than all these traditions of men that have been added over the years. Be, be, be committed to the Word of God. But it's interesting. Notice what he says to this church. Chapter 3, verse 1, to the angel of the church at Sardis write, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up! and strengthen the things that remain, which are about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. He says a couple things about them. Off to a good start! But he's found their deeds not completed in the sight of our God. It's interesting, the Reformation got started on a real good note, but in very short order, even during the lives of, of, of Luther and, and Zwingli and, and, and many of these other guys. Protestantism became more of a political movement than it was a spiritual movement of God's Spirit. Do you realize that? It suddenly became a very political thing. That's why Europe became geographically divided into Protestants and Catholics, more than spiritually divided. And on top of that, 
as good a start as it had, it kept a lot of those old traditions that came from pagan origins within the church. Infant baptism was continued. Uh, a lot of the ceremony and the pomp and the structure continued right on, hardly changed. That whole thing of a separate hierarchy, the, the, the clergy, as opposed to the laity, continued on. It wasn't complete. And he said, you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. Consequently, there was a deadness in so much of mainline Protestantism. And sad to say, sad to say, it's been the Protestant churches, the mainline Protestant churches that have opened the doors to liberal theology. The likes of Karl Barth and uh, Rudolf Boltman, Paul Tillich, these guys that came along and began to attack the inerrancy of the Bible of God's Word, begin to deny the supernatural, deny, deny the miracles, deny the virgin birth, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. They denied the prophecies were legitimate prophecies as they tore away at the Scriptures. They deny the rapture. And consequently, today, you've got pastors in Protestant churches that don't even believe the Bible is God's Word. And you will find many of these guys getting behind social issues of the day like uh, free choice, pro-choice, uh, same-sex marriages, you know, free sex, uh, you know, all those things. Pastors getting behind that. And no wonder, because these seminaries, there are so seminaries that you can go to. They're not seminaries, they're cemeteries. Spiritual cemeteries. I kid you not. One of the big items of, 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 of study in seminaries is what's called textual criticism. And they go through and they give all their intellectual reasons why the Bible can't be God's Word. And I went to a good seminary. And uh, we spent a lot of our study refuting the textual criticism of the day and pointing out the, the weaknesses and, and the holes that was in that intellectual thinking and just verifying the Bible. But you know the sad thing about it? Young men who want to just serve the Lord and they feel a sense and a call and they, to the ministry will go to these seminaries as believers and come out as skeptics. And then they go into their churches in, 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 that, in that spirit. And so what, notice what he says now. Uh, that so much of Protestantism falls into this category to this very day. And, and he says to that church, notice there, in verse 3, about midway through, therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. Does that make you think of something? Behold, he comes as a thief. Be ready. I will come as a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. You know what he's saying? Unless you turn around there, I'm going to come, and you're going to miss the rapture, and you're going right into the tribulation. Let me say this. Let me say this. When the tribulation actually comes, the visible church of quote unquote Jesus Christ will be alive and well, dancing into the tribulation. And there will be Sardis, and there will be Thyatira. But then we come to Philadelphia, and Philadelphia is a breath of fresh air in this whole thing. Notice what he says to the Philadelphian church, verse 7. To the angel of the church at Philadelphia, he who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one will open, says this, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut, because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Interesting thing occurred beginning in the 18th century, um, primarily and into the 19th century, and that was a great spiritual evangelical awakening taking place not so much in the churches but amongst Christians. 
It was like the, you know, the, the, the mainline Protestant churches were such as they are, and the Holy Spirit began to move on people's hearts and lives. It was during that time, 18th century, 1700s B.C., that a movement got going in Germany called the Moravian uh, Brethren. And you know what they decided to do? We're going we're to get together and pray. We're going to pray for, for, for this world. We're going to pray for people. We want people to find and know Jesus Christ as their Lord and the Savior in the midst of all the religious stuff that's going on in the name of Christianity. And they began with prayer meetings. And they prayed and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. And pretty soon the movement just caught on like wildfire and began to spread around Europe. And they were the first ones that said, let's go out and proclaim the simple message of the love of Jesus Christ in this world. And they went out and they started doing that. The missionary movement began with this little Moravian brethren in Germany that wanted to get together and pray. And then you had about the same time the Puritan movement in England. And there was such great persecution there by Protestants in England against these that just wanted to follow the Lord with all of their heart. You know what they did? They jumped on little ships called, like, called the Mayflower and said, let's go over and maybe we can have some freedom and peace and worship our Lord with all of our heart over in that place called America. And they began moving to America. It was during this period that in this group, guys like John Bunyan, who was thrown into prison and spent that time writing The Pilgrim's Progress, second most purchased and read book in the history of the world next to the Bible. And it was John Newton who got saved during that period and wrote that hymn, Amazing Grace. And then there were evangelists like John Wesley and, and George Whitefield that just went out just to proclaim Jesus and there was such a hunger out there. People would come in droves just to hear what they had to say because they wanted to hear about Jesus. And that went on. Uh, David Brainerd went to the American Indians and, and, and a whole bunch of guys got on their horses and put a Bible in their saddle pack and, and they went out west with the Westward Movement. They were the, the I, I, itinerant preachers, you know, that just went around proclaiming Jesus. One guy was called Brother Van, and he went up into the Dakotas and Montana and like that when the Gold Movement was taking place there and established literally hundreds of little fellowships of believers and churches that just wanted to follow Jesus. It is not surprising that it was during this area that the World Missionary Movement really got going. And they said, there's a world that needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so you had during this period... Guys like William Carey, who was moved by the Lord to go to India and, and begin to proclaim the gospel in India. You had um, David Livingston, who went to Africa. You had Hudson Taylor, that went over to China. You had a Dyron, a, a Dyron Judson out of our own states that, that went to, to Burma. Literally thousands came to Christ. The, the ministry was going on. And you know what? That... that that movement of God's Spirit of a pure and simple fervency for the spreading of the message of Jesus Christ, which is so akin to the first century, that's why we spent a lot of time studying the book of Acts. Because it's the work of the Holy Spirit in the world today. To this day, that movement has literally gone into every nation of the world. Every nation of the world has been introduced to the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is interesting. Because Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Isn't that interesting? And so, here we are. You know, um, he said there that for this group, I'm going to open a door and no man can shut it. And that to me is so exciting in this world when there's so much persecution against the gospel. And there's, in, in, in our own country, it is not cool to be a fundamental Christian. And to Islam, you're the devil. And yet what's happening? Iraq, hundreds are coming to Christ. Many of them, because people are afraid to even say anything, through visions and dreams, the Lord is bringing them to Christ. And they're going around looking for a Bible and a church. Iran. Iran. You know Iran. Hitler is ruling Iran. Reincarnated. That little guy. <laughs> Iran. In the last few years, a million have come to Christ in Iran. Thank you, Jesus. The Sudan. You've got a radical Islamic government 
in control in Sudan that is literally practicing genocide against Christians. In 1979, it is estimated there were 500 believers in, in, in the Sudan. Today, it is estimated there are 5 million. You see what I'm saying? One person dies for Christ and several come to Christ. And so, and so these are the kinds of things that are, Jesus said, I open a door. Believe me, no man's going to shut it. Hallelujah. You're on the winning team, brethren. So, man, you know, gird up the loins and go for it. <clears throat> he says to this group in verse 10, and this is interesting, verse 10 of chapter 3, because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also grab this, will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. He had said to Thyatira and he had said to Sardis, you're going into that hour. He says to Philadelphia, to these, he says, I'm going to keep you, grab it. I'm going to keep you from the very hour of that testing. The very time of that testing, I'm keeping you from that. You know what that means? That means before that great tribulation period comes, he is literally taking us out of here. Those who just want to follow and serve and believe in Jesus. Pretty simple. Church at Philadelphia. And then that brings us to the church of Laodicea. Oh, hang with me. You know, you know the time's up right now. But I can't stop here. <laughs> hang in there. Go as fast as I can. So just turn to Laodicea. Now the Laodicea, we No, i got to go. <laughs> Laodicea is particularly interesting to us because it is the church of the last days. It pertains most directly to us than all of these other churches is the church of Laodicea. Because it is, he says, this is the church of the last days, the church of Laodicea. The word Laodicea means people's rights. Isn't that interesting? I think that kind of capsulizes what the last days church is really all about, brethren. It is characterized by a phenomenon of people deciding what they're going to be taught rather than the God's Word or the servants of God. Paul warned about this in 2 Timothy 4.3. For the time will come when they will not endure. He's talking about the end times. They will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled. They will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. They want to be appeased. They want to be tickled in church. They want feel-good churches. He says that's going, to, that's going to characterize the last days. More important than God's will are people's rights. So you have churches that now tolerate and advocate all kinds of worldly ways. Okay, you know, this is the 21st century. People live together before they get married. It's the way it is now. You don't expect me to do any different, do you? Got to go with the times, don't we? After all, it's my right. I can do what I want to do. That's my Christianity. You better accept my Christianity or you're being judgmental. I know some people personally that are in the whole homosexual movement that consider themselves strong Christians. You better accept my lifestyle. Who are you? And so you see those kinds of things going on. You see churches that are embracing aspects of Eastern mysticism to enhance their worship. Or maybe secular psychology, you know, so that people, their people can get professional help from secular psychologists. Uh, <clears throat> it's sort of the attitude, if it helps, if it attracts, if it satisfies people, it's not just okay, it's just the right thing to do. You know, um, here's what he says to that church. Let's look at it. Verse 15. I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were hot or cold, but because you are lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. 
because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. That's his word to this church. It, it's a church that's built and it's grown through the ingenuity and the means of men rather than by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the attitude of this church is what we need is more people and more money. That'll solve everything. People and money. It's, it's a lukewarm church. Tepid. It's not cold or cool, which is so refreshing. And it's not like hot water, which is so useful. Jesus has his most castigating words for this church. He said, I will spit you out of my mouth. The word there in the Greek is literally, I will vomit you up. And so, brethren, here we are. And uh, the clear panorama of church history from the age of the apostles to the present is laid right before us and it was written in advance. And here's the point. When the gospel reaches every nation of the world and the church of Laodicea is alive and well out there and growing and doing well. Not to mention you've got Sardis and you've got Thyatira. And praise the Lord in the midst of all that, there's Philadelphia. You are right at the brink. You're right at the brink of section number three of Revelation coming to life. And he said, and write the things which will take place after these things. And it's the end of this age. So here we are. And we have before us a, a great danger, but we also have a great opportunity. The great danger is, is just quietly becoming Laodicean. Quietly just, you know, be, be becoming, uh, uh, emphasizing just being comfortable and, 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 and just sort of sliding and, and drifting. If you allow yourself just to slide and drift in your Christianity, you're just going to slide and drift into, into Laodicea because that's the church of the last days. But great opportunity. And the great opportunity, brethren, is so outlined right there in the verse 8 where he says, Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. He says, you have the opportunity for your life, such as it is, little power, little life, little group, to count for the living God in an eternal way. Every one of us. That's why Paul says, I beseech you by the mercies of God just to present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is your spiritual service of worship. Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you can prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. God can use you. He puts before those who are his an open door, and no man can shut that. I know several testimonial examples of junior high and high school kids that came to Jesus Christ and went home as a new person, were laughed at by their own parents, but the long and the short of it was the parents came to church to find out what all this was about because of the changed life of their teenager and came to Jesus Christ in faith. Wow. Wow. So here's where we're living, and I wrap it up with this. Here's where we're living. We're living very much like in the days of Joshua in Israel when Joshua said, you choose this day whom you will serve. Because there's a lot of phony gods out there that want you to worship them. It's like Elijah said, if the Lord is God serving, if that Baal is God, then follow him. But Joshua said, as for me and my house, we're going to follow the Lord. And what's next for that? Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. Heaven is open. A voice like a trumpet said, get up here. <laughs> and I was in the presence of the Lord before his throne. Wow. Let's pray. My Savior, my Jesus, choose.